Hi there. Glad you're here today. My name is Cheryl Phillips. I'm with the Seattle Times. And what we're going to do is just introduce ourselves, and then I'll start the presentation. Feel free to jump in at any point with questions, but we do ask that you use the mic right there. Um, and we will have a Q&A session kind of at the end as well. So go ahead, Ian, and I think your mic is right there. And introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. My name is Ian Kalin. I'm the director of open data for Socrata, Seattle business. Uh, previously uh, worked with Google.org on civic data, and before that with the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy on open data. And I'm Whitney Stensrud, also of the Seattle Times. Um, I'm assistant managing editor for visuals and overlook photo, design, graphics, all that good stuff. And she also oversees the interactives that we do. So uh, as I said, my name is Cheryl Phillips, and I'm uh, the data innovation editor at the paper, which basically means all things data that have to do with stories, I have my hand in in some small way. So without any more, I'll just go ahead and, and get started. So I'm starting with kind of a, just a blast to the past here, but you know, Journalism is full of innovation, and it's been that way for a long time. And even the typewriter was once considered an innovative technological tool. As a matter of fact, I think there were a lot of complaints, according to a paper I read, uh, from the folks who didn't have typewriters when typewriters were first getting started in newsrooms because they were so loud and uh, clackety, and they really ruined the atmosphere of the place. So uh, this is just a reminder of the fact that we're constantly innovating. And now we have a lot of data, and we have a lot of open data, and a lot more uh, in the way of technological tools that allow us to innovate. So we're going to talk a little bit about how to innovate in ways that make sense, and how to, to play to our strengths, which is storytelling, and using, using data effectively. So this is an example of a blog post that uh, was done, I think it was the Orange County Register, about uh, the number of city workers who are making $100,000 or more. Great, and in a you know, nice little post story. In the old days, you know, that would have been it, but, and it might have just appeared in the newspaper. But the, the paper did a nice thing here, they, the site. They provided a couple of links so you could get actual pay detail worker by worker and a, and a breakout on full-time workers only. They have two different links. So let's take a look at, at what those links look like and how that helps us understand the story. Yikes. So it is sorted by total, but that's about it. And I don't think it really helps inform the story. And I, I have to say the Orange County Register does a great job of lots of data visualizations. This was a while ago, so I'm not trying to ding them at all. Um, we used to do this too. <laughs> so it's, um, but it's an example of how not to deal with your data online. You want to watch out for just taking a bunch of data and throwing it out there. What we try to do is add some context to the story. And um, let me just flip over here. Oh, where do I get it? There I am. No. Oh, oh I got it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's this one. So this is the actual, we did a similar story where we took a look at city employees making $100,000 or more. And along with that story, what we tried to do was highlight the main theme of the story with our visual. And so the, the theme of the story was the fact that this, this increase in workers who were making, the number of, of employees making $100,000 or more was driven by three departments that had recently signed new labor agreements uh, with with their depart in their departments. So it was the city light, the f police department, and the fire department. I think we had a nickname for that, like guns, hoses, and wires, or something like that. <laughs> and, and so that's how we started this little visualization. Uh, this is in Tableau. Um, you know, we, like most newspapers, have limited resources, so we use a lot of tools that are free to us. And then we try to pick our spots for when we really do some development power. This was one where, that we built in Tableau. The nice thing that, about it is that as a reader, as a user of this story, you can read the story, you can see the main theme, and then you can explore it yourself, taking a look at the departments that you might want to look at. So we could uncheck the Seattle City Light and the police department and take a look at the different scales of some of the others, like here's public utilities again, and here's the public library. 
much smaller. I can take out utilities and just look at the library. What the heck happened between 2008 and 2009 that they you know, increased by that, that much? I mean, there's a lot of other stories in here that the reader can then explore as a result. And so it allows, it allows you to not only get across your main theme, but then also, also let the reader kind of explore their own story as well. And I'm going to hand this now over to Whitney a little bit to talk about this particular, this is another example of a, a data set that we did something with. Go ahead. Um, this is sort of the story of the graphics department, a life of the graphics department. This is what we see first. Um, for, especially with our huge interactive, uh, or sorry, our um, I team, investigative teams work, they'll bring piles of data to us and say, what's the visual story here? What are we going to do with all of this? Um, something that's tricky with people who have worked really hard to amass data is that they love it. And they're really proud of the effort that went into amassing all of this data. And they think that every one of you wants to see every one of those numbers and spend hours pouring over it. So it's my job to come and say, let's just dive a little deeper into here. It was a good job. We love that you've done this. But what's the story? What do we want to do with all of these numbers? And what do we want people to walk away with? In this case, he was so proud of all those numbers. It's the only database in the world that has every single elephant, birth and death, and why, the cause of death um, in the world and, that, and global data. <laughs> so it's that we were sitting there, okay, well, we could map it, you could search for it, but the point was that there's this, this crazy yearning to um, get an elephant birth at every zoo in America, and they are not successful they die at a greater rate than what they can successfully birth. Um, and that's what we needed people to come across with. So we, we went for really simple. It doesn't move, it doesn't do anything, but it's powerful. Um, what we did find, though, is to put our development resources into another story that isn't quite as numbers-driven, but was very um, essential to the story of these, these zoos in captivity and this tangled web of incest and their plight to try to inseminate these elephants. And so we wanted to show people what that web looks like. This is a local elephant, and this is what his family tree looks like. And it's not pretty. And we made it be, you know, it's, you can take it um, here. Well, this is the interactive version of that. We have to go down here. Okay, then. okay so this is over time. And you'll see we have a live dead is dark, and um, the orange is what you want to watch for when they try to do these little inbreeding. Um, but the point was for you to get that, yes, it's messy, it's not pretty, and it's probably not ethical. Um, and that's where we put our development time, because it's a tough story to tell, um, especially in print, in a static nature. Here, we were able to utilize the web and all its tools so you can actually follow how this thing comes about. One of the things I liked about this visualization is it, it took a narrative arc. It, to, it basically, Whitney, they pulled out of that entire mass of data one story, and they used that one narrative point to tell the story of the whole, and that's why I think it was so effective. And there's methadone. Oh, sorry, I back. I went, I went ahead when I wasn't supposed to. So um, methadone was uh, another investigative. I used to actually be on the investigative team. So when Whitney talks about people giving her big masses of data, <laughs> I'm, I'm fortunate. I'm probably one of those people. But uh, the methadone project used another method of of taking that data and being able to tell a story, and that is that it, it basically, we chunked out little sidebars. So for the entire theme of the methadone investigation, which was that this prescription painkiller was killing people and killing uh, uh, poor people more often than killing wealthier people, 
um, we wanted to be able to tell some sidebars out of that, some other small stories. So we tried to, to break off the data points for that into small sidebars, visual sidebars. And so we have several different interactives where you can take a look at the data uh, for those points. Um, and that's why we kind of tab them across the bottom of the overall project page and, um, and take a look at the data. And then the, the other thing about this is that it's all, each one of these uh, data visualizations is you can download, which is um, really useful. Oh, let me go back one. The other um, visualization that we built here was one, and then it's the one in the center here, tells the, basically the story, again, that it's, it's kind of so, um, supports the main theme of the story. And it maps the deaths, the methadone deaths, with, um, and overlays them over census tracts based on median income. So that you can see that there are more deaths clustered in the lighter areas, which are the, the higher uh, poverty areas. So that's another example of kind of where we, where we tried to use the data in a way that would help us advance the story in a, in a kind of a variety of ways. There you go. So um, part of the benefit of having the, the mic in my hand is that I can talk about how the internet didn't invent data visualization, even though it seems like that sometimes, that it's this recent phenomenon, um, and it, w it came along hand in hand with Facebook. Um, but we at the paper have been doing it for a very long time, and, um, and that actually has given us this fabulous discipline with our creative process because we had to work within the confines of limited space and a static environment. Um, so when we approach these large projects, we have to find this, the real story that we need you to know about. It's, it's akin to the novel versus the short, short story, right? The novel affords you the luxury of a lot of space and time to develop your story, um, and it also provides opportunity for you to stray way off point or maybe lose a reader. Um, so we want to take the discipline that, that a short, short form writer has when we're looking at our graphics. Um, and we have great purpose with each one. For the one that you saw before, and you, can, you don't have to go back, it's okay, but is we tackled gas prices. But the story is, well, how are we using our gas? How is this going to affect you? And how are we going to make you read this? Um, here, our main purpose was it, to inundate you with data. We want you to feel overwhelmed because our purpose was to try to prove to you that yes, global warming is real, and we're going to show you an entire page of data that's from the, the, all around the world to overwhelm me with this fact, so it's not part of the argument anymore. Um, here, we are trying to get at the, how, where inflation is hitting you, where is, it, where is it attacking your pocketbook. Um, and all of, there's a lot of data behind all of this. This is looking at uh, regional economies and how they're faring right now. So um, choosing the key indicators, deciding how to compare them. But what we walk away from after looking at all of these and working with the, within the confines of a, a print medium is um, this great sensibility that we'll take with us to the digital sphere, which is full of bright and shiny objects. You know, you have more space, unlimited space. You have, uh, you have uh, the opportunity to explore, it's um, to discover things. And so that you can harness, but it's one of those do it for good and not for evil. You run into a lot of things online where it's just like, I, I don't know what to do with this. What is the purpose of this interactive? What is the purpose of this story? Um, and the main tenet that we live in with the print graphics in which we take to our online work is don't waste people's time. It's, it's just so rude <laughs> to waste your audience's time. And, and, and it keeps you in line, it really does. The thing, you know, we'll do, we, it might mean don't visualize something that you can explain to somebody in one sentence. Don't waste my time. It takes a lot of time to digest an image. And if I get to the end of it and find out that, oh, you could have told me that in two seconds, I'm irritated. Um, or maybe you want to employ all of your uh, digital, your visual strategies to 
to get someone through a story, orient them. Um, here we're using illustration to try to set the tone to, so you know, okay, this is the mood. This is a lot of economic data. We're trying to um, explain how the recession is, is impacting the, the local or the region. And I want to just interject here because I don't know if you can tell from where you're sitting, but that image on the front page is a watercolor. And so, you know, Whitney's team built this incredible visualization of kind of the recession's toll, and they, and they set the mood by kind of painting this dark, somber kind of watercolor. I don't know if you disagree with that. But, <laughs> no, yeah. No. I mean, that was the point. And we yeah. used a different type of illustration technique on the inside page, which is where you do get inundated with a lot of charts. And, uh, but there's, so there's all of these tools that you can use to try to lure someone in, but, but help them. Everything should be purposeful. Um, we want to set a mood because that gets you one step closer. You don't need to try to figure out, should I feel bad about this? Should I feel good about this? Should I not feel anything at all? You know, these are all tools that you can do to help someone get through this quicker. It's about accessibility and education. And, and here again, we had the print version and then we also provided um, all of that online in, uh, in a more interactive form. Uh, whoops. We forgot about that one. We'll get back to that. Um, so here is just one example of part of the visualizations that we did for the, the toll of the recession. And, and it just picked a few kind of key data points and visualized them and allows the reader to explore them. This map was interesting because what it, what it does is it shows the um, uh, free and reduced lunch program and the participation in that um, by school district and how it has risen the percentage that it has risen. Um, so, you know, it, it is a kind of, I think, a powerful way to look at things visually and also in an interactive, interactive form. And we gave the page itself had an online presence where you could tab through it and you got all of those little charts. But this was a way where we've decided, okay, well, we're going we're gonna to choose these three indicators here and let you explore a little bit further. So it's not a redundant storytelling. It's contextual. Um, it's supplementary. And again, not wasting your time, hopefully. <laughs> and I'm going to go back really quickly to the, this thing that we, this budget game, um, to talk a little bit about, wh again, where, we, where do we put our firepower? Where do, we, where, we, where do we put our limited resources? And so this is one during the legislature where we uh, created an interactive game that allowed the average reader and the average citizen to try to take a stab at, at, at balancing the, uh, the budget. And you can just kind of basically click and drag these. Maybe we may scroll down a little bit. And if you hit the little, the little information uh, button, then you'll learn what's involved in each one of those cuts. So we're trying to educate people on what you can still cut willy-nilly, which, I'm, you know, I've, I'm not going to lie. I've spent a few times just dragging stuff in just to see the just rainbow pile Just to explore it, up. right. Um, but they... But it was a way to get people involved to say, okay, see, this isn't actually that easy of a task. Um, when you're cutting this large program, those are jobs that are, that are at the end of that line. Um, but yeah, this was a great piece of development work that was new to our little department. Uh, this is another one where we um, try to make sure that we are using, when we're using our resources, that we're using them in service of the news. So you may all, uh, some of you have been familiar with the bridge collapse that happened in the spring, Scavage at River uh, Bridge collapsed, and I was really involved in this particular project, came rushing in at 8 o'clock at night, downloaded the federal database of all the bridge inspection records, analyzed it for the stories that went into the paper and online, and then also cut, sliced it off for our developers and our interactive designers to be able to build this um, whoop, that, went, that went with it. So this, here it is. And again, we tried to employ some storytelling techniques with it. So by selecting on each one of those little squares, it actually gives, shows just those bridges, but it gives you a little bit of information. So 20 bridges are fracture critical, which basically means if you hit it in the wrong spot, it could collapse, which is what happened with the Skagit River Bridge. Um, and then 12 of those carry, you know, a fair amount of traffic. And 
so those were, I thought, really important points for the reader to be able to know. The best way to be able to tell that story was to just show it to them. The other thing that we did as part of this is that we provided the data below so that if somebody wanted to look at the entire spreadsheet of all of those uh, structurally deficient bridges, they could. And, and grab it if they wanted to and explore it on their own. We were getting a lot of tweets and a lot of reader engagement from people saying, where is this data? Where can I look at it? I want to you know, analyze it, different folks. And so this was a way to improve our ac accessibility uh, in the project and do it on the fly. So this was up the next day. The bridge collapsed on Thursday, and we had this up online on Friday. So. And that, you know, I think was a good use of our resources, although I was really tired at the end of the weekend. And, and this is just kind of my final, kind of a little bit of a tangential point, but I think it's important, and that is, as it's somebody who analyzes data for stories, it's really easy to focus in on the data and miss some important points, and that is, where isn't the data? What, you know, we always often look for outliers, but w what about where there isn't data? What are we, what are we missing? Now, a long time ago, I, in the 90s, I was working in Montana, and I had to cover a story up at a reservation, Fort Belknap. It's this gray spot right there where there is no broadband. And uh, I sent my story at the one private telephone, using the telephone line, um, on the, in Fort Belknap, and then drove four hours back to Great Falls, Montana, and the next morning, the, the folks who I had used their phone, their last name was Cuts the Rope. The Cuts the Ropes called me and said, so did your story get in the paper? And I said, yeah, it was about a strike. They were striking, again, the picketing in the school because they thought their principal was racist. So yeah, I got in the paper. And there was this long pause. And Clarence Cuts the Rope said, oh, well, um, is it a long story? I said, oh, not too long. He said, yeah, it was about, you know, about a medium-sized story. Another long pause, and he said, well, you know, we don't get the paper for another two days. This was in the late 90s. And I said, no, I had no idea that you didn't get the paper for two days. And he said, would you mind reading that to Marge? That was his wife. <laughs> and so I, I sat in a rocking chair and read this story to Marge Cuts the Rope so that she could tell everybody else on the reservation what the story had said. And, you know, the story had good impact. The principal got removed. But um, I, missed this. I missed the real story. All of these little gray holes, that is Fort Belknap. And this is now. That, they have no cellular wireless. They have, they have no broadband. Do you see the, the, the hole is there on every pretty much metric that you can think of? So there's a story there about how they, in, in the 2000s, and have no access to, to the digital world. And what we're all about is trying to improve access and create access so that, so that you can have greater impact, which is what Ian is going to talk about. So I guess my, my point about this is, is that we need to remember the Fort Belknaps of the world, and that is the road into Fort Belknap. Go ahead. Wow, uh, a tough one to follow. Um, the format that we're going to uh, jump into here, so we had a fantastic presentation from the Seattle Times on interactive uh, data. I'm going to talk for a shorter bit of time on how uh, data visualizations can lead to impact, and then I may or may not ask some questions and then open it up uh, for everyone here to drill us on how we can similarly tell fantastic stories with data and uh, lead to fantastic improvements to our world. So I'm going to do a little tech switch here and go to my own presentation. Um, okay. so. Uh, my name is Ian Kalen, Director of Open Data for Socrata. Socrata is uh, located in Pioneer Square, just down the road. And it's an interesting little uh, startup business. Uh, we started as a company called Blist, which probably you've never heard of, uh, because we were trying to do basically some form of content hosting uh, and help organizations publish their content. And to lo and behold, we got a phone call from the White House. They were trying to put a spreadsheet on a website. And lo and behold, about four or five years ago, not as easy as you might have thought to put an actively updating spreadsheet on a website because what the president was trying to do was to show a very simple table, column of names uh, and numbers, which in and of itself is not very interesting. But what they were showing was the lobbyist disclosure form and the White House visitors log, which is a proxy for corruption, right? So how do you get that spreadsheet on a website? Well, they call us and we had some interesting technology at the time and we said, wait a second, this is a really interesting idea. We can actually put data out there to help the quality of democracy, to improve the services coming from our broken government or those of the governments that may not be so broken, maybe just help them do a bit better. 
So the company, the startup company, pivoted, uh, renamed themselves Socrata, and now we are leading some of the most innovative cities, uh, states, counties, nations uh, around the world to put more of their content online. The fun part about this business, uh, the open data business, uh, is that it's leading to all sorts of interesting impacts driving citizens and residents to respond and interact with their governments in an improved way. Uh, but what I'm going to go into with uh, just about four or five case studies is how that's actually happening. So uh, let's start with uh, the, the Fed. Um, I really did think going into this open data space that it would be uh, more uh, partisan, more polarizing. After all, one of the first actions that the president uh, did when taking office was to uh, launch the Open Government Initiative, which was not just data on websites, but also trying to improve the transparency and accountability of uh, the federal government's administration. The funny part about that is that uh, Eric Cantor, uh, some of you may know him as being uh, very opposed to the president's general principles, was just at the Data Tech, uh, Technology Coalition speaking about open data as well and open government. This is not a partisan issue. Data in and of itself, even though the facts may be aligned in certain ways, data itself is not split along party lines. But the funny part about that is uh, transparency alone does nothing. Data by itself is useless. You cannot eat it, you cannot drink it, you can't pour it on a wound, it doesn't do a damn thing. But it's how data is used and transformed that it can have that tremendous impact. Uh, visualizations is one of the ways in which that can happen. But that's not the complete story. I love the interactive uh, demonstrations, but I also think that there's a coda, there's a, there's a piece missing from a bit of how data interacts with the world. If transparency can lead to data, data can lead to accountability. It's only as good as the people who can take that information and are fueled to action, who do something about it and take that data and turn it back on the government or to some other process, even if you can, heaven forbid, commercialize that public data and create new products and services, then when you can actually create an impact with that data, that step in the process. Again, transparency first, you gotta be able to open something up, something up which a lot of folks don't necessarily want to because people are always afraid of airing their dirty laundry, right? But if you can have that initiative, get the data out there and drive the accountability, it fuels an action that can actually improve really everything that we are, we're working with in my space in the government sector. It can lower the cost of healthcare. It can improve education systems. It can actually help fight crime, right? And so with, with that context of how data works in the visualization world to improve the interoperability and the quality of services from government, Let's, let's dive into a few, a few examples and then we'll, then we'll open it up. Uh, first, we have to recognize that, of course, uh, data is often uh, um, not very understandable in its raw form. Uh, I humbly purport that the government is very good, usually, at wholesale, not very good at retail. They are very good at generating data. How they use it is not always so fantastic. But I will bring up a recent example of uh, transparency leading to action. So this is just a, not perhaps the best visualization, and it's not interactive, by the way, but it's uh, a result of an interesting open data movement. So the Center for Medicaid and Medicaid Services, although part of a current uh, healthcare.gov debacle or fiasco, whatever the secretary said this morning, uh, they also did something kind of cool. I'm going to give them a, a little, little uh, uh, piece of credit a few months ago. They released the pricing for the top 100 procedures performed by every hospital in America. Basically, if you invoice Medicaid and Medicare, that's public dollars going for uh, private services. Well, they're not going to show the cost of the individual patient, but they can aggregate. And when they published in, in total the top 100 uh, procedures, they saw drastic differences in pricing. How is it that in this case it's Miami, a hospital, liter two hospitals uh, literally across the street from each other, can have such drastic differences in pricing? You know, pricing's a funny thing, right? It, it, it shows, in many ways, the efficiency and operations of that business, but two hospitals that should be alike in dignity, to tell the two cities across the street from each other, so to speak, how is it that they're invoicing such dramatically different prices? You know, the healthcare sector doesn't advertise prices very much. You don't know how much, most of you, if you're going to a hospital or a healthcare service, you may know how much your copay is, but you don't know how much the federal taxpayer is paying for it. So through the leadership of CMS and under the president's open data initiative, we got data out there. And in this context, in Miami and also my uh, home city of San Francisco, the local legislator uh, at the county level who maintain these hospitals are saying, wait a second, how come we're losing money on this hospital and we're charging half as much as that guy across the street? Or lo and behold, uh, in the case of San Francisco, when you overlay demographic information and the poor people are being charged more than the rich people for the same services. These, that in that case was a legislative response. People were drawn to action when you finally figured out how much you're paying for that same service. Uh, but there are many other aspects, of course, of how you can present such fantastic pieces of information. 
So I have up on the screen uh, uh, data from the open data site of New Orleans. Uh, it's a little fuzzy, actually, but it's a blight status. It shows uh, con uh, properties that are still in a blight condition as dictated by the uh, local government, so uh, dilapidated buildings, uh, safety violations, uh, faulty permit, basically uninhabitable situations. Um, when you saw the concentration of that, from an aerial perspective, people were driven to greater action. And on the right, we have a, a representation from a similar hurricane to literally show not just the reality on the ground, Yes, I know that there's a giant hole in the ground. And yes, we need to get it to a point where it's restored in the case of this fright graphic. But to see it from an aerial perspective, it drove the policymakers of New Orleans, and this is where I think you're all very familiar with at this point, to concentrate and retarget their efforts and show how some wards were being repaired slower than they should have been compared to some of the other wards. So the takeaway from this, uh, I'll call it cartoon narrative, uh, is that the data is needed, visualization has made it possible, and by the way, maps are an interesting way to visualize. Of all the visualization techniques, pie charts, tables, uh, you know, trend lines, the fun part about a map is that it's very emotive instantaneously to the reader, so to speak. As soon as you see a map, especially if it's of your own hometown, it strikes the emotional context of your brain. And you have context oftentimes without even having to have, needing to have a headline. So maps are very powerful in the world of visualizations and have an unusual capability of driving people to claim ownership in their own hometown. Right? And so in this case, the mapping visualizations were very compelling to basically drive internal and external support to improve the rate of blight restoration and turn more of the homes in the upper right-hand corner to those looking like those in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, so publishing data, though, in the right way drives, can, can drive people to action if it's framed in the right way. And so it's not just putting it in a table or a chart. And I love the story of actually the elephants in terms of, you know, when I saw the birth chart, I'm like, okay, there's a bunch of elephants. I'm not really whatever. But then when I saw that visualization of the orange lines, I was like, oh, wow, that is kind of, that is immoral. What's going on there, right? So yeah, it's how the data is presented. So um, uh, I'll give two, two stories of how to show uh, data in a way that can drive people to action that affected the feedback. It's the, it's the presentation layer, I'd call it. So on the right, or excuse me, on the, on the left is uh, a wall like hundreds of thousands of walls in the, and I cannot pronounce this correctly, so forgive me, the Rajasthan area of India, uh, to show basically expenditures, uh, census information, and uh, income level. The government had fuzzy data. It did not have enough information on what we would consider uh, social security benefits. So not knowing if people were alive or dead, or where they lived, or their address, they took the action to paint, literally, on hundreds of thousands of walls throughout the region and say, this is the best data we got. Here's the fun part. People filled in the gaps. They literally took a marker or a pen or whatever they could find and went to the wall and said, oh, I know that person. He moved. They did that across, across the country. And the government came back later, weeks or months later, hundreds of thousands of walls and said, oh, this is very helpful. Now, it's basically crowdsourcing, but it's a non-tech crowdsourcing where people went to the town square and said, we want to actually help this because in that situation, they're trying to get some money. So talk about an incentive. They just needed to be able to put the right mailing address in there. On the right-hand side, does anyone, by the way, a show of hands, does anyone recognize this map on the right? Not that you could. So some folks, okay, it's a point map, right? This is not a geospatial. There's no lines and polygons in this one. But it's uh, pretty recent of the addresses of gun owners in, in this case, it's Westchester County, uh, shortly after the Connecticut school shooting that happened just a few months ago. So is it moral, is it right, is it a violation of privacy for a newspaper to publish addresses? Here's the funny part for me. The data was already public. It was already out there. You can you, Freedom of Information Act, Transparency Law, Sunshine Law, you're all probably from cities who have something like this. You could have got it as a PDF download. But it wasn't valuable. It didn't have the context to drive people, in this case, to different types of actions, but the, the point here is just the way the information is presented. It wasn't enough that it was just open. Open data is not enough. It's how you use the data that can fuel people to, in this case, I, I would say have a policy recognition, uh, have, uh, or if he had some massive potential, I won't go through the, the full story in the interest of time, but if you overlay demographic information, the race and gender of uh, these, these neighborhoods with these addresses, you suddenly have a very different type of story in terms of the uh, perception, the fears, the risks that people have around gun ownership in America. So there's this, there, the, the, the point here, the, the narrative is that um, data in and of itself, again, not useful, but the way it's presented, if you don't present it in the right way, you cannot drive people to action unless it's in a, in a format that can let people digest it, understand it, and then personalize it to a point of movement. Um, and so I'll, I'll just conclude here uh, and then open okay, a couple of questions for the panel. I don't know, maybe have some for me and then we'll open it up. Love to hear your feedback. Uh, so again, uh, although uh, I'm obviously a data geek and I love 
uh, the power and potential, the governments in particular are not very good at extracting value from that data. Hell, they can't even get it out there. And so I'm very proud to be part of a, a startup business that is helping governments publish their content, but ultimately, it's not enough. It's not just that they have the, the fields of grain that they're trying to advertise. Who's gonna take that grain and turn it into beer, right? How do you take that information and translate it through the wholesale process to extract the value from it? And with the proper storytelling elements that uh, my, my, my panel colleagues here so brilliantly explained uh, in terms of what the Seattle Times can do, if you translate that wholesale data, you can drive people to action. The data uh, itself requires a, a transparency uh, commitment, an open government commitment on some level, from uh, the, the smallest mayor to the presidents of the nations throughout the world. But with the feedback loop, with the accountability that comes from publishing data, people can hold their governments more accountable. People can be driven to greater action if the visualizations uh, are provided, because visualizations are the key. The storytelling is the key. They can allow folks to understand how it impacts their own lives, how it impacts their kids, how it can impact their homes. And that part is essential for all those, I encourage you, of course, working with data to find, we were probably in this conference, of course, you're all working with it on some level. Uh, very much look forward to seeing and hearing more about what you're doing to make data valuable. So uh, with that, I'm gonna maybe uh, improvise a bit here and ask one quick question to my panelists, maybe entertain one, and then in the interest of time, we'll, we'll open it up to the crowd. Um, so my first question, so you talked about uh, how the data can be extracted from the Seattle Times site. A very technical question, but it sounds like this crowd knows this stuff. Um, what kind of formats and opportunities do you have? How can it, is it all just download in a PDF file? No, or are there other definitely ways to get there? No, definitely not PDF file. Um, uh, usually if we're putting data up and then we want people to be able to download it then, um, especially if we're using it like a Tableau type uh, product, then, then in that case you just download that entire workbook and then you can extract it as an Excel spreadsheet or a tab delimited file so it's, it's or close to the raw f format it's, that it was generated yes, in. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. And it's the same thing like even with that spreadsheet that we did of the, with the map of the bridges, you could just grab this, you could just grab that data right off of there because it was in spreadsheet format right there and just grab it and paste it someplace else. So yeah, we would like to make, make it available in a, in a raw format wherever, wherever possible. Because, yeah, I have to deal with PDFs all the time. And, and try to break data out of them. And so I tend to not make the PDFs. I wouldn't do that. There's no from Adobe here, is there? That's probably Sorry. somebody in the crowd. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have a question, though. And that, it, well, I'm not for sure question, but I think it's a point of discussion. The, the point about the gun, the gun map I, it was, a, was really interesting because as a, it, I belong to a listserv of data journalists, and it was a real point of controversy, actually mostly condemnation, uh, most journalists that I know of would not have published a point address level map of, of gun licenses. We would have used the data visually. We may even have mapped it to a general block or, a, or a, you know, maybe a zip code or something like that just to be able to tell the same story but without putting out specific addresses. And the, the discussion that happened, I think as a result, they changed the state law. So now you cannot get that information anymore. So... It, to my way of thinking, putting that map up at exactly the addresses, you know, the, the argument was that, well, you're violating the privacy of these individuals, and now somebody could go try to break into their home and get their guns or, you know, something like that. I, I don't know if I agree with those particular arguments, but what happened was, is, was that access was shut down as a result. And I think you could have still told the story and even looked at the demographic trends without, without publishing the actual point map. Um, and maybe even mapping it in some other way. So I think it's really important when you're talking about open and accessible data that you make it open and accessible, but at the same time provide some safeguards so that you don't end up having to shut down things. But I'm interested in your perspective on that. Yeah, I, I, well, I don't have a close enough opinion about whether that one newspaper made the right decision. But I think more broadly for privacy controls, particularly in government data, and, and Edward Snowden aside, whether that's a legality question or moral question, I cannot speak to that. What I can speak to is the way government addresses privacy versus the way private sector addresses privacy. That's something I can speak to. And I would say that, uh, by and large, uh, governments don't even recognize the private information that they have. It's sector specific. Healthcare has some stronger laws. Uh, but for example, uh, a, a number of cities are pushing for building energy information disclosure. So the kilowatt hour consumption, the, the, the light, the electricity consumption of uh, buildings. You know, is your, is your energy bill private? Um, is your transit route private? Um, you know, I, I had an experience when I was working for the Department of Energy um, where I would say the average 
uh, person, I think, is still evolving their uh, feelings around it. So we had an app. It was the Apps for Vehicles Challenge. And when the app was on a phone, people were fine with it. But as soon as I put that app mounted on a car, it was one of those electric car uh, vehicles that had like the basically iPad mounted on the dashboard, we got lawsuits. We got accusations basically saying, hey, that's an invasion of privacy. My response was, but it's the same app. It's in my pocket. How is that any different? No, 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 no. If it's on the car, that's in a violation of privacy. If it's on your phone, that's fine. Which makes no sense to me, right? It doesn't, how can that possibly be true? But yet, it's, it's the feeling that people have, uh, I would say there's a bit of a cognitive dissonance in terms of uh, what counts as a violation of privacy, how much am I giving to Google, how much am I giving to Facebook, and how much does the government already have? I think a lot of it, frankly, depends on the quality of service. Um, I think everyone is, most, everyone in this room probably has a smartphone. All of you are probably giving away private information, and you probably don't care, because you're getting a smartphone, and it's awesome, and you're happy with a smartphone. You're like, well, it's, it's worth it, that seems fine. Uh, but when it's the government that may not be delivering the quality of service that you want, when you go to the DMV and it's like, this is a terrible shopping experience, and then they ask you for some more personal information, suddenly your standards change, right? You're like, well, well I'm like, this sucks to begin with. Why am I giving you more of my privacy? Right? So that, I think, is more of a testament to the quality that, of the service the governments are providing or the, maybe the security people feel around guns in general, less so about the individual uh, objectivity of privacy violations, I think it cannot be taken out of context. I think you need to put it in the in the frame of whether or not you're happy with the services that you're receiving. It also goes to what you were saying about how maps are are more of an emotional um, product. So when we're mapping something, it's you know we always stop and ask ourselves, is this a geographic story? What is you know sometimes it's a knee jerk reaction, oh map it, but is it is there a geographic story to be told there? or are you mapping just because you have an address? Um, you know, I'd say that for the gun map, that address, those points were not the story. The story would be the analysis that you'd get, ag aggregates were there, or, or against demographics, you know, so that you could tell the exact same story, and, then, and that's just editing. And, but, but I think there's a great responsibility with anyone who's visualizing data or making any sorts of graphics and illustrations, the minute you make something visual, there's a huge responsibility that you're, you are creating a reality that didn't exist beforehand. You're creating a universe that people can see, and that's a higher level of understanding than looking at figures, at data, that's just, it's, it becomes more real. And I think that's a responsibility that should be held seriously, whether it's gun data or government related or something that's much more local. But you are, you know, accuracy and credibility need to be at the forefront. So, I think let's open it up for questions. Um, please come to the mic. The brave first question. It's always the hardest. Thank you. In context of what you're talking about, I think it's relevant. Um, I visualize it in 3D yeah, in using the Earth platform, basically brings you even more emotional to, to, to your connection and decisions. And I use Socrates data. And um, I wonder if you guys actually filter your data, look at your data uh, before producing these maps. Uh, for example, in the, in the guns map, um, if we did that for Seattle or in the Metadome map, the interesting part to me is, um, are those occurrences exactly what they're saying? Because if you aggregate them, you're going to be misleading the public. Um, so, for example, the crime data <coughs> of Seattle, apparently most rape events happen in the Harborview Hospital, and most uh, crimes against people happen in front of the court or the police precinct, and because that's what data is reported, is not what happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so if you don't curate your data and clean it up, you're actually doing a disservice. That's exactly so right. I, so I wonder how much do you t touch the data and how much you just pass along to avoid any responsibility or liability. Well, so, you know, that is such an important point. As a matter of fact, I think it was LA Times, was it a year ago or two years ago, where they created a, a map, they had their crime map, and, and I can't remember how many, there were, there were hundreds, if not more than a thousand, but there were a lot of crimes at exactly, as you said, I think it was at the police department, and um, they hadn't caught it because they just, published the map and and they didn't re they didn't really analyze it first and and what those were were where when somebody went in and they didn't have or they didn't have an address what they would do is they would just put in the the address of the police department and then when you mapped it out on the latin long you would have that and i know of another story a long time ago 
that was kind of a cautionary tale in my world of data journalism where a, a journalist who had just started playing around with data got neonatal deaths, pre you know, so, so to kind of look at, at problems with care and mapped it by zip code, I think, and ended up doing this whole story that they published, it was a small newspaper, about how all of these, uh, this one zip code, this one area of, of, the, of the region had a real problem with, with, with um, deaths of, of infant deaths, and it um, turns out that's where the hospital was. Hmm. With, had the big neo, you know, neonatal ward, and they hadn't checked it. <laughs> and so it's, yeah, you have to be, I think the level of responsibility is, is huge. The other thing is that what we often do with crime, especially with uh, rapes, is we, if what we try to do is get that data to the, I mean, well, we get all the data pretty much to the 100 block level, and then we try to make sure we communicate that this is to the block level, that it's not to the exact point of address. But on top of that, we try to filter out or account for those other kinds of things. I think curation is an analysis before you post any data is absolutely critical. I also think there's different levels of responsibility on where you are in the process. So let's, I wish I had a slide for this, but I'm just gonna illustrate it visually or verbally for, for just a quick moment. So there's the, the point of data generation, and whether it's through the internet of things, or meters, or people checking boxes in the field, some of that's junk in, junk out, and so I recognize that. But at some point the data is generated. Most of the big organizations that have data to share have an internal storage problem. The, the ETLs and the API capabilities are not fantastic from the government, and basically unless you're a Fortune 500, you're probably failing at it. Um, and so once it gets to the point of publication, you got two steps before you even worry about whether the data is good, right? Like, it, it, before people can start to hold that publisher accountable. And so I, I believe that the open data basically resolves in an ecosystem. T to answer your question, does, does Socrata curate the data and show uh, whether it's junk in, junk out? Short answer is no, we don't. Uh, we believe that we should improve the discoverability and accessibility of that data so that I can work in an ecosystem where folks like the Seattle Times can look at the data for the first time ever. Man, I was looking for this. Now I found it through data.seattle.gov. Awesome. And then they can say, wait a second. This is, something's missing from the story, but at least from our point in the ecosystem, uh, for, at least for now, we do not assume that responsibility because we're just trying to get it out there. Trying to get it out there in the raw form, in a machine readable, human readable form so that smarter folks, more innovative folks can look at that data and then take it upstream. And I'll just add to that that I think that's a really, and I'll, then I'll turn it back to you, but I think it's a really important point because in the years past, how we got, for example, crime data is, you know, we would put in a public records access request to the police department and, and then after some time passed, we might get it. And then um, we would analyze it, and then if we wanted the next month's worth of data, we would have to put in another request yeah. and go get it. And then we've had a kind of a standing request where we get it, but now we can get it through an API from Socrata, same data, but it's, you know, it, it's much more efficient for us to be able to suck it in that way. Right, but Socrata is now publishing maps, and so once you start right. aggregating those balloons mm -hmm. and increasing the sizes of the maps and put them around two or three blocks, now you're telling stories, and, and that's the, the, the challenge of the curation. At what point does it happen? Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's an excellent point, right? So I, I, again, I'd like to reiterate that open data by itself is useless in my mind. Any data by itself is, is inert. I'll say a better, better way of saying it. Um, I believe that the average person doesn't care about data, uh, not in the context that we're talking about it here from a digital accessibility. So I do believe that it's the responsibility of a publisher to provide some degree of consumer-ready uh, interactive layer. So what I would consider, it's a great point in terms of us providing maps, but you'll see, as, and, and, and for those of you with laptops, I almost encourage you to check it out, um, there is a very short step from the uh, flat file to the geocoded map. There's, uh, in the narrative around it, the metadata, is as provided by the publisher. Now, uh, is government data reliable? Our gov is government data trustworthy? Um, I would say that they don't, it's not something that we should, I think, from our perspective, have an opinion about. I think what we need to do is help them connect with their citizens, help governments connect with their residents, because right now you can't even get the data in a lot of cases, so it's very, very hard. And so we see as long as we can provide the pipes, the channels for you to not just get the data, but then provide feedback to the publisher. The data's wrong, which is from a simple button. You know, it, let, let me show another example. So when you, when you buy, I was gonna say, a Halloween costume from Walmart, and it breaks or it rips, you take it back, right? You're like, give me my money back. What's the government version of that? How can you transact with government and say, though this data is terrible, where's my get help button on a lot of government websites? My humble opinion is you're usually not gonna find it, right? And so I'm not saying that my, my small startup company that I have uh, the privilege of working with is gonna solve all those problems, but it, it's a type of feedback loop 
that otherwise would not be available at the data layer, at the transaction cell layer, to say this one piece is wrong. And I'll, I'll give another example to show my empathy for this, frankly. You know, I, I live in San Francisco, and I saw some of the crime rate in my own neighborhood. I have a, I have a newborn child, and I, I'm curious about the crime in my neighborhood. And lo and behold, there was uh, prostitution uh, happening very near my home. And it got, happened always on the first of the month. I said, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, oh, that's when the police were going through my neighborhood, and that's when they cited this one event every single, okay, okay, well now I know. Uh, the data was messy, but I can also show the frequency of apparently the patrol is once a month, okay? Now I'm a more informed resident that can take this to whatever, and how I choose to act on it is my own business, but I wouldn't have even known that unless I had a machine-readable way to plot it very quickly. Well, if you're making it accessible to everybody, then presumably the folks who might be getting cited could figure out that trend as well. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good point. Go ahead. Sorry. For the Times, I'm a big fan of Tableau Public and the software that you're using to make those infographics. Mm -hmm. And I see that those are optimized for desktop. And do you have a plan for how do you resize those for tablet and mobile devices? Because they're not by nature responsive. Is Actually, they, they are. Are they responsive? Yeah, Tableau is responsive. Okay. So anytime you use an embed code that you get from, from Tableau, that uh, what happens is when the, it, your device senses it, and it senses the, and the I mean, it, it can tell which device you're on, Tableau can't, the code from Tableau. And so it will change the, you know, it'll, it'll like you can tap or you can, you know, do your things on an iPad or a phone. Um, th the one thing it doesn't do is if you have a chart that extends this way yeah. and you're on a phone, <laughs> it, you know, you're still going to have to scroll over to, I mean, it's not going to change. Like if you do four columns of data uh, and it's wide, it's, it's not going to be optimized for a phone, you know, it's not going to be great for a phone. So it can't, re it can't re recontextualize the data for right. For it's device. not going to do that. Okay. And so that, yeah, that and that's come up actually in the last week and a half or so. We changed um, something we were doing and didn't do it in Tableau because of that, and ended up just it was just a, a table that we're making available, just a, a table of data um, for folks who want to have that level of accessibility. And we took out the bar chart, didn't do it in Tableau. I think we did it in Google Fusion Tables instead, mm -hmm. um, and just just for that reason. And then any other tools that you're using? Well, we, we use Mapbox sometimes for some mapping. We use Google Fusion Tables. We um, do sometimes just do some development kinds of things with you know, Django frameworks and mm -hmm. um, you know, just do a lot in JavaScript sometimes. So we have a um, Whitney's crew basically does more of that level of, of work. If it's, if it's something that's, you know, I, I can do the tab some of the tableaus, Whitney can do some of the tableaus. I don't know if you want to address any of that, but. Well, our, we have a tiny development team. Um, so we're really just trying to grow that part. So getting responsive design as a, you know, a benchmark and, and not just for projects and, you know, but there's the amount of build time just to start to get that kind of um, responsiveness then eats into what we can do with project level stuff. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's Django's the, the tool of choice for our web apps people. Thank you. I don't even know what time it is. I don't even know what time it is. Like basically one more question. Yeah. So I think we're, do we have any other questions? Suggestions, comments? Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you.